Welcome back to the Berlin Marathon build up here in Kenya. This is week seven, and it's basically the last week of hard training, you could say, before the last week, which is a taper week. And I'm heading off to Berlin tomorrow. And um, before I do recap the week that was sort of seven days before Berlin to 14 days before, I thought it'd be a great opportunity due to um, having not really gone into much detail about this, talking about how I designed this training block, how I coach, and also how that links with the Kenyan running, training and racing philosophy. We've just recently had quite a lot of people join the Sweat Elite Coaching Academy over the last few weeks. And it's always been really interesting to me how people take different approaches to how they plan training. It's not only about the way that the training plan is structured, it's also about what data and what metrics people like to follow and what, motivated, what actually motivates them to train. So obviously some things that come to mind are following heart rate, other things are following lactate. I've even heard of some people that really like to use cadence and power. And obviously there's the one that I probably use the most that is sort of target paces or target efforts. So I don't necessarily stick to one particular thing, but one thing I've really clearly noticed, I've noticed a lot of people that have become very, very clever, borderline obsessed with data, heart rate, lactate, comparing at mileage, trying to stick to a particular mileage. And I can think of virtually no examples of people that have actually gone on to improve a lot after that, which is almost counterintuitive to what you would think. You would think that the smarter you get and the better you get with data, the more you would improve. But my observation is actually almost the opposite. I've seen a lot of people too that have, that have gotten very obsessed with data. They've gotten very obsessed with a particular heart rate and I'm not necessarily completely against heart rate. Heart rate does have its, uh, its place in some training programs and some people respond well to it. But I've seen a lot of people drop it all and completely start focusing more on their effort and making sure that they're listening to their body. Fundamentally, that is the core message here of listening to your body and running everything to effort. Uh, at the end of the day, you have to listen on your body. That's one of the important things. I've seen a lot of people do that and improve quite a lot. And that, actually, that example actually includes myself. One great example was today, we caught up with uh, Tedeschi Abraham from Switzerland, the national record holder, who's been training with Canova for this whole block, along with Amanal Petros and many other people. And we observed from them, Angus and I, that um, they are given a training plan where they have paces to try and hit on particular days, but it's made clear to them that they don't have to stick to the training plan 100%. They have to listen to their own body and pick and choose what they're able to tolerate. And if one particular workout is way too hard for them, they might try and complete that workout, but then the next couple of days might be a little bit easier. They might even take a complete day off. They might cut back a run from uh, one distance down to uh, a shorter distance. They might even completely skip the next workout. And that's a very classic way to go about it here in Kenya. Everything boils down to listening to your body and percentage of effort and making sure that you're able to try and hit the percentage of effort in each workout that you're prescribed. So I actually prescribe to my own athletes, 85%, 90%, 95%, and on easy runs, if they ask, what should I be doing on an easy run? How should I be doing it? I always say, if I stopped you at any point of the easy run, you should tell me that it's no more than a four out of 10 or a 40% effort. I've always found it absurd and really unnecessary if people are trying to hit an exact mileage metric at the end of the week and they're adding on Ks at the end of the week. That, in my opinion, is something to completely avoid. But across the board, that's really how it's done here in Kenya. And, uh, and it's been definitely very fundamental to my understanding of training and racing to spend time here. And I really hope that uh, I can pass on some of those learnings to you guys. And if you do end up coming here, you'll really notice the same things as well. So Angus, who's been filming this entire uh, project, he runs with the Kenyan groups all the time. He loves it because Angus is very much a, a non-data driven person. He runs without a watch all the time and, and is, is very much a, a more into the trail running scene. But he filmed and joined a fartlek session and also an easy run with some of the local groups here that are the groups that sort of the athletes tend to start at before they might get invited to a, a team, like an Adidas team or NN running. Morning. Woo! Out this morning with Ben is running. <laughs> Again. Okay. And we are making our way down towards the very well-known Kenyan fight leg. Basically, a massive fight leg session that takes place um, every Tuesday and every Thursday in the time of E10. Uh, generally brings big crowds, um, big running pack, 
and it's also a little bit of a race. <laughs> the aim is one rep. <laughs> You'll notice that in these videos, it's very, very loosely structured. Um, you know, these fartlek runs that, that uh, you'll see, are just they have no really prescribed pace. All they have is an amount of time they're running for. So it's either 25 or 30 by one Here minute, or it might be 20 by yep. two minutes on, one minute off, or 13 or 14 oh. by three minutes on, huh? one minute off. But the terrain is just insane. It's hilly, it's rocky, it's, it's, very, um, it's not very flat underfoot. So there's no way these guys can really run. I mean, they don't have heart rate monitors, obviously, but there's no way they can even really run to a particular pace on these runs. Uh, they can probably think about an average pace they might want to do, but because it's so hilly and so rocky, um, it's, it's, the paces are just always changing. So uh, a great example and a great sort of demonstration of what I sort of just spoke about. Um, Angus heading out to, to join these groups on their, on their workouts during the week. Oh my goodness. <laughs> just in Europe, we're like sort of decent club runners. Here, one rep in, I'm blowing up my ass with two women and like one little kid right at the back and I'm just fucked. This video series is sponsored by Saw Running, my favorite running apparel brand based out of the UK. You'll see everything I wear in this video series to be Saw Running. They produce the best singlets and the best tights and marathon shorts in the game. Top for Running, one of Europe's fastest growing running retail stores that stock all the top brands, all the latest models at the lowest prices. You can see them at the Berlin Marathon. They'll have a booth at the Expo. If you're looking for a new pair of races or trainers, do not look past Top for Running and use the code Sweat Elite at checkout to score the lowest possible price. You can find the link in the description of this video. Precision Fuel and Hydration, look no further for the highest quality electrolytes, carbohydrate drink mix, and gels on the market. The caffeine gel is my absolute favorite, and you can use the code SWEATELITE-YT for YouTube, 15% off your order at Precision Fuel and Hydration. Pillar Performance, a sports micronutrition company that I've been working with for quite some time that create the triple magnesium blend that has really improved my sleep. You can use the code SWEAT15 for 15% off your first order. HVMN's Ketone IQ, a relatively new supplement used by many of the world's best endurance athletes, such as Sarah Hall, Cameron Worth, and others. You can use the code SWEATELITE to score a 20% off discount at checkout over at HVMN, and you can experience the magic of ketones yourself. So, perfect timing to, uh, to transition to the week that I actually had to make some changes because where we finished off last week was in the 2x10K workout uh, on Sunday, on, the, on September the 10th. And that was, a, that was a pretty hard workout. I think I said it was about 90, 95% effort. And the next week of training, we had planned three days later uh, with Eric to do a 10K tempo run on Moyben Road. So three days after a 36K run with 20K at marathon effort. And I did originally think that they would be pretty hard to recover in time for that. And I was, I was definitely correct. So I took Monday off. On the Tuesday, I did a 12K run at 4.12 pace. Uh, in the afternoon, I, I, and I did feel quite quite tired in that run. In the afternoon, I did a 7.2K run at 4.50 per K. Uh, so that was on Tuesday afternoon. And on Wednesday was the planned 10K run with Eric. But coincidentally, Eric and I both warmed up and in the warm up, we said to it, we, we were talking obviously, and we, we sort of said, I'm not sure how this is gonna go today because we're, we're, we're very fatigued. And I, and I even said to him the day before that would it be possible to, uh, to push the workout out a day, but he was actually leaving on this day, on Wednesday afternoon, flying to Berlin. So it, it worked best for him to get this workout uh, done on this particular day. But I started the run. I hit the first, uh, the first K in around what I would have thought would be my threshold effort. I think it was about 321 or 322. And I carried on for a few more K. And I could tell, I just had a feeling about the run that I was very fatigued, very tired. Uh, 322, 323 pace felt very hard, whereas 325 pace per K, just three days earlier, I felt very smooth and comfortable. And I decided at just over 4K that I'm going to, uh, to, to stop the run and replan the week. And it was probably the best decision I've made in the, whole, uh, in the whole training block, at least a course correction. And Eric, strangely, stopped about a kilometer later saying the same thing. He just felt very tired. He couldn't hold. Uh, when he was running at his threshold effort, it was very, very tired. His legs were very fatigued. So we stopped and we jogged through until uh, 16K. And... Uh, at the time, obviously, when we're cooling down, we were both a little bit like, oh, have we, have we overdone this? Have we, have we actually reached a point of like overtraining here? Um, but uh, it, was, it was definitely a good decision in retrospect now, filming this uh, on, on the Monday afterwards, uh, because I was all good. So the next day I woke up and basically played the next few days 
day by day without having a firm plan, but I had a vague idea as to what I wanted to try and do. So the next day I woke up and I thought it would be, um, it would be fine for me to do a longer, easier run. Africa loop, what are you saying? <laughs> Africa <laughs> loop, baby, woo, let's go. <laughs> oh, it's a rain. So Ooh. I did it very easy and just made sure the effort was super easy and controlled. And I even took a few stops because the guys uh, behind us wanted to, Mazin and Jay wanted to take some stops. So that worked out perfectly. So that was on the Thursday. So even though it's 20K and I just said I felt like I was overtraining, pace being 4.46, um, this was a very easy run. Um, you know, the week before I ran it in 4.25 per K and even that was quite easy. So this was a very easy effort. Now I woke up the next day and I wanted to do something. I wanted to make sure that before Berlin, between then and now, I wanted to do a couple, some reps at least, some intervals that were quite a bit faster than my marathon pace. So I, I prescribed a session for myself that I actually prescribe many athletes that I coach at the Sweat Elite Coaching Academy. <coughs> I think the trouble is there's no other really flat 400 meter uh, stint in Italy. Well, you're doing a timed workout. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't really matter. I was hoping to hit paces today though, like uh, definitely well quicker than marathon pace, 10K and 5K pace. But if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. So this is Camerini Stadium, which uh, was uh, before 2016, where all the big dogs trained. Uh, David Radisha, uh, you know, Wilson Kipsang, there's a bunch of guys that broke uh, world records as well through between 2000 and 2000 and 2016. But there was an election here in 2016, I think, might have been 17. And the government promised to redo the track and they basically tore it down and then just left it. It's a common thing in, here in Kenya. But apparently they're, they're building it up now, but they've only gotten this far so far. Um, but the track itself is not in the best condition now because it's been... Uh, not, uh, not, yeah, not maintained at all for years. So we hope to do, rained. we hope to do, our, yeah, we hope to do our session here. But I didn't realise it was going to be this wet. It rained overnight, and I, I was asleep through the rain, so I didn't know how long it rained for. Clearly, longer than I thought. So I have to find somewhere else, I think. Hey, what do you have to say? You want to do some one-minute reps? <laughs> Doesn't want to join. Okay, feeling good. We have to adjust the week a little bit um, because I had signs of maybe overtraining on Wednesday uh, when we tried to do a 10k tempo. So we pulled the pin on that session, only did 4k and very glad we did because just yesterday's easy 20k run and this morning's warm up, feel good. Feel like I'm uh, not at risk of any sort of, uh, yeah, you can, you can normally tell just by a 15 minute jog if you're, if you're struggling or not, so I feel good. So let's get into the two sets of 10 by one minute. Uh, so nine days out now. This was planned to probably be tomorrow or the next day, but we've re rescheduled the week to make it a little bit easier because last week I think was a little bit hard. I think uh, I pushed the limits a little bit, uh, a little bit too much, but we're all good. Adjusted, a few easy days, good to go. So let's try and get this workout done. So it's two sets of 10 by one minute. And it's a workout I think can be actually very effective for many, diff many different distances at almost any time in a block. And it's one that sort of works a little bit on threshold in the beginning and then a little bit more on VO2 max. But the two sets of 10 by one minute are both slightly different. The first set is supposed to be done at not threshold pace, but more threshold effort with just 30 seconds rest. So you're going 10 by one minute on with 30 seconds rest only. That's a very short rest made even shorter. Well, when you're at 2400 meters altitude, that rest is very short as in your recovery is, uh, your heart rate's not dropping too much. I didn't have a set pace for this. I thought I'd go about 305 per K because um, if, uh, if the idea is to get a threshold effect out of it, you'd be running a little bit faster than threshold pace normally because you're going uh, 30 seconds rest all the time. I ended up with 257 per K, which was very promising. It was a bit quicker than I thought, but all was good. So we're also training in the middle of the day today and every day till Berlin because the forecast in Berlin is, at the moment as it stands, about 16 to 18 degrees Celsius. So we've been training in mostly 10 to 12 in the morning. So in the day, it's like 19, 20. So trying to get used to being uh, training in conditions that are a little bit warmer than we have been because I feel like even five degrees is quite a difference towards the end of the race. So midday now, probably 20 degrees. Okay, so another minute on, yeah. but now a minute off instead. Yeah, so first set was supposed to be more like a threshold effect, even though obviously it's faster than threshold pace. We're just going one minute at a time. The second set's supposed to be a little bit more VO2 max. 
so a little bit more, a little bit faster. I hope to go at least 255, closer to 250 pace, which is for a minute, it will be like doing 400s in 67, 68 if you went on to the 400. So I should cover 370 ish meters. But yeah, 10 by one minute, one minute rest this time. Between the two sets of 10 by one minute is four minutes rest. And in the second set, you want to make the reps a little bit quicker with longer rest, with one minute rest, more like 5K, 10K uh, pace or effort. So again, I went into this workout without really set paces in mind. I just wanted to make sure the, the effort was there that I wanted it to be at, more like threshold first set, VO2 max second set. And the second set was closer to just under 250 per K, so 257 per K for the average of the 10 uh, reps. And this was, I, I was really happy with this workout because after Wednesday, of course, there was like a little bit of a concern around, have I overdone this? Have I crossed that, that overtraining line? I'm not sure. Um, but I was pretty sure that after the Africa loop, I was fine. That run felt very easy. And this session felt fantastic. How's that? Yeah. I'm so glad I pulled the pin on Wednesday. I've said that, but I felt so good today. It's just 250, 247 pace felt pretty easy. Like flowing in a rhythm, no forcing. I managed to do about 247, I think, per K average for the one minutes. And yeah, it just went really well. Wednesday was a bit of a concern, but we're all good for sure. That just, I don't actually remember if I've ever been able to run sort of that pace 247 to 250, sort of feeling like it was so, so smooth. And that was the hope, it'd be about 5K pace, which I've never run a 5K quite in 14 minutes, but um, I guess my goal would be 14, 20 or something like that. So great workout. Thanks for the help guys. Here's my team this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've been supporting you the whole way. Uh, they appeared in the second set, which was helpful because it got hard a little bit after five reps. And then they paced me out for a couple of reps out this side for 20 seconds. But uh, yeah, how is, how is everything? How is school? Good? I think they're maybe in their first year of learning English, perhaps. I think they, they learn when they're about this age. <laughs> how are you? I'm fine. They know that one. There you go. Of course they do. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. That was sick. That was great. Um, and I will say that between Wednesday and Friday, some might be wondering, like, did I do anything in particular to recover from this? I did put a huge emphasis on making sure I got enough sleep both nights. Um, Pillar Performance has been a sponsor of this series. I'm sure you've seen the ads. I've been taking the Pillar, Pillar Performance triple magnesium drink every night, and I do fundamentally believe that's helped my sleep a lot. I've told people and many of my friends that have tried it have also uh, found the same benefit. So I made sure I was getting into bed at nine o'clock every night and making sure that the environment I was in was, was, was gonna make sure I had the best chance of sleeping eight hours, which I did both nights. And I also ate a lot in those two weeks, in those two days, a lot of carbs and a lot of protein. So I really focused on eating a lot of rice, a lot of pasta, a lot of veggies, and then a lot of red meat that was served here at the, um, at the guest house. So uh, I think those two things um, and really making sure that I tick those boxes properly help me sort of bounce back very quickly from feeling like maybe I'm overtrained to actually having a fantastic workout in just two days. Um, so that went very well. Uh, and then the next two days were just easy runs because now we're starting to wind down into a taper. And so I just did a 10 mile run, 16K at 422 pace. And I uh, laid out my taper plan here in the, um, in the description of the, of, the, of the Strava log. And then on Sunday, yesterday, I did 14K at 410 pace. Uh, and once again, these, Paces are just purely to running to how I feel. I just have to, I'm just trying to basically run to easy to moderate effort. Um, but I announced a few more races that I'm actually gonna be doing after Berlin, which is pretty exciting. So I'm gonna take on a challenge uh, that I've set for myself uh, of doing five marathons, uh, Berlin being the first one, and then I'm doing four more in the following 10 weeks. Some of them I'm going all out and trying to see if I can run a little bit quicker than in Berlin. And some of them I'll be uh, pacing friends and, uh, and doing a couple of other things. So you can see them on the Strava log there. But I will be at Berlin. Uh, I will be at Chicago. I will be at Indianapolis. The fourth one I've undecided. There's a couple of options. And then I'll be uh, at Valencia as well. So that was really the last week of, uh, of hard work. 101K, which I think is 66, maybe 67 miles. And now it winds down. So we'll go over the next week, obviously, in the, in the, in the Taper Week video. Um, but I fly out to Berlin tomorrow, so I travel in the way as well. But uh, that's now one, two, three, four, five, sort of six weeks of very specific, very, uh, you know, quite high mileage. I'd say my average there across the last six weeks is probably about 140 to maybe 145K, so about 90 miles. Uh, and, yeah, the block's been... Um, 
99% basically gone to plan. So got to be happy with that. I think if you can get through a training marathon training block that you're working this hard um, at this altitude, if you can get through it without any sickness, any, any injuries, uh, I definitely consider myself very lucky when I get through a block without, especially without getting sick. Um, so yeah, very happy with how the block's gone. Really appreciate everyone that's been uh, following along so far. We've got two more videos to go, the Taper Week video. We've also got the race recap as well, which hopefully is a positive one this time. Um, but uh, thank you so much to everyone that's tuned in. Thank you to the sponsors and I'll see you next week.